Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord today. It is a fantastic day to be alive and to be in his house. I hope that you are happy to be here today. Children, you may be dismissed this morning. Thank you to our children's pastor, Tracy Baldeo, and to Miss Millie Howard, who leads our BGMC Sundays. We are super excited about you, and thank you for your leadership. Children, have a fantastic day time. Proverbs chapter 17, 22 says that a merry heart is good medicine. A joyful heart is good medicine. And so part of my calling in life is to put a smile on your face. So here we go. I'm reminded of the man who went to the doctor. When he got to the doctor, the doctor told him that he only had six months to live. The man said, oh, I'm willing to do anything it takes, whatever it takes to prolong my life. Is there anything that you can prescribe, doctor? And the doctor thought about it for a minute, and the doctor said, well, um, well there is, there, there's a couple things you could do. You could sell everything you own. You could purchase the smallest house on the busiest street in town. Go ahead and fence in the front yard and buy yourself five goats. Go ahead and then move your in-laws into the house with you. And then go ahead and buy the junkiest pickup truck you can find. You know, one like you got a hot wired every morning and it's got a flat tire by the time you get home from work every night. The man thought about that for a minute and he said, Boy, doctor, I'm, I'm willing to do anything at all here to prolong my life, but I'm, I'm not sure, is this really going to work? And the doctor said, well, it may not prolong your life, but it will make the next six months of your life feel like an eternity. Uh, thank you for the complimentary laugh. I love you all very, very much. Julia, thank you for serving on our media this morning. Thank you, Nate Bittinger, for serving on our camera today. We love and appreciate you all very much. Kane, he must work for the Union Hall. He's on break somewhere in the world, but he is working in our sound this today. I love you all. It is a great day to be alive. I'm super excited to be here. God has something terrific. Say terrific. God has something terrific for us today. Julia, please show us our one-sentence sermon for this morning. By the way, we are just now, today's the first Sunday, we're going to start a four-week series. I'm super excited about this. Jesus is real. I'm super excited about this. There is a a culture that we live in that teaches us that truth is relative. Like there's not really anything real sometimes or a lot of the times or ever. But I'm here this morning and I am representing God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. I'm just human. I'm just flesh. But it's my hope and my prayer that today that you hear, that you feel, that you sense that Jesus Christ is the real deal. Got a one sentence sermon for you today and that's this. Jesus is the real deal, not a cheap, counterfeit copycat. His love is the real deal. In this culture we live in, we chase counterfeit love. It's not real what the enemy has us chasing. We chase counterfeit hope. It's, it's not real, but we go chasing after it anyways. We, we try to chase counterfeit joy. It's not real, but we chase it anyways. But Jesus is real. You can count on him and his power, his love, and his grace. Because the gifts that he has is real. Watch these scriptures as they unfold. Miss Julia, what's our first scripture? Luke chapter 9, verse 18 to 20. Watch how the scripture portrays Jesus is the real deal. Now, it happened that he... That as Jesus was praying privately, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? Like, if I want to know what you were all saying, I'm going to ask some of our other pastors. Because you all don't tell me nothing. What's the crowd saying? Jesus says, who do people say that I am? What are they saying? The disciples said, well, you know, some people think that you're John the Baptist reincarnated. You're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some people think that you are Elijah. The disciples, one of them looked right at Jesus and said, some people think you are Batman. And then Jesus asked this very familiar question when he looked at Peter and he said, 
who do you say that I am? I want you to know in your heart of hearts this morning, deep down at the center of your being, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Savior of your soul. He is the resurrection. He is the life. He is our everything. And everything that he offers is the real deal. It's not a counterfeit. In this scripture, previous to this scripture, you can actually read in Matthew, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he, particularly here in Luke, right before these scriptures, the disciples were seeing a lot of action. As a matter of fact, the crowds in every town where Jesus went to, he was preaching, he was teaching, people saw him raise the dead to life. People even seen him heal a woman out in the middle of the street who had been bleeding for 12 years. He healed her. They watched as energy and power and glory and healing went from him to her. And the crowd stopped and they were amazed. They saw Jesus at work. The disciples themselves, Jesus prayed for them once. Before this scripture, before this story, before Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? Jesus anointed his disciples, and they too went from town to town preaching and teaching. They too took their bare hands, laid them on other people, and they were watching healings taking place. They were watching demons run for their lives. Still, before this scripture, as Jesus was preaching and teaching from town to town to town, people came to Herod, King Herod. And they said, hey, there's, there's still this ruckus going on. These people are still following this guy. Say that guy. They're still following that guy around. There's crowds everywhere he goes, out in the countryside, in town. And Herod said, well, who, who, who is this guy? And again, the people were saying, well, some people say, this is what they told Herod. Some people say, this is John the Baptist come back to life. You know what Herod saw? Herod saw John the Baptist's head on a platter. Herod said, oh, that can't be John the Baptist. He's dead, and I know it. Oh, well, maybe it's this person and that person and the other, and it's this and that, maybe one of the prophets from old. And Herod said, I don't know, I don't know. And Herod then is recorded in the Bible, in the book of Luke, by saying, I have to go see this with my own eyes. Maybe you're here today. You're at a point in your life when you have to see this Jesus with your own eyes. You have to feel his comfort, his joy, his peace, his love, grace, his mercy. Maybe today's the kind of day where you need to feel his real deal presence in and around you and your being. And I'm telling you that Jesus is the real deal and you can really trust him. The Bible says in our very next scripture, Miss Julia, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, one of the, one of the, uh, um, one of the sects or one of the uh, groups of the uh, Israelites of, of the time, the Jewish culture, they were called the Sadducees, and they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe that there was an afterlife. Friend, if there's no afterlife, if there's no resurrection from this dead into the next, where I get to spend my eternity with Jesus Christ, then I'm not interested in today. There has to be a resurrection. There has to be real life. There has to be a real deal Jesus. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. How many of you know that Jesus, he talks a good game, but he makes a good game happen. He perfects the game of life. He is the author and perfection of your faith. In this scripture right here, Jesus is talking to Mary and Martha, and they can't believe that Lazarus is dead. And Jesus said, fear not. Say, fear not. Fear not. Jesus says, because even though Lazarus is dead, I know it's been four days since he's been laying in the tomb. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Oh, and then guess what? Jesus did this little thing like bring Lazarus out of a tomb where his body would have been smelling. The Bible says Lazarus was wrapped in cloth and Jesus spoke to the cloth like he spoke to the wind. Those cloth, that cloth, his clothes fell off of him. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come out and live it up, baby. Today, wherever you might be at in your life's journey, Jesus is saying, I am your resurrection. I am your spiritual resurrection. I am your spiritual life. Jesus is saying, and when you pass from this life, we all die. Only a few, only a few went from this life to the next without passing through death's door. Elijah, Enoch, even Jesus died on a cross for you and I's sins. Oh, but he came back to life. He bounced back to life. And today he's got life and life abundantly offered to you and I. And this world right now, the world we live in, has us chasing counterfeit love. This world we live in right now has us chasing counterfeit joy. The world we live in right now has us chasing counterfeit everything. This next scripture we want to show you. Julia's adamant about showing you all these scriptures today. I don't know why. Jesus said this right here. Watch this. I am the. Say the. I am. This is Jesus talking. I am the only way. The only you've heard this a thousand times forget like you've ever heard it before pretend like you're hearing it for the first time this ain't the same old story this is Jesus Christ saying I am the way I am the truth and I am the life for you I am the answer for you legitimately you walked in here today you were greeted by some good looking people probably some of the most best looking people in three counties they shaking your hands and they making you feel at home and welcome. We got coffee and carpet and everything. <laughs> but today, Jesus wants you to see past all of that. And he wants you to experience his real deal presence. Nothing for nothing. I got a text today. I get them all the time. Somebody's not having a good day. The enemy is overwhelming them. Today, if you come into the sanctuary or you're looking online and today the enemy is overwhelming you, the point of today's message is that Jesus is the real deal. You can really trust him. He is not a counterfeit copycat. His Bible is real. Allow those words to jump up off the pages and become a part of your life. Say life. Everybody lives, but not everybody has a real life. You might be breathing. There's something to be said about real life. Jesus is that real life. He's not a counterfeit copycat. He's not a cheap imitation. Here in America, we are famous for chasing counterfeit, cheap imitations. It's what we do for a living. It's like our thing. My friend Morgan, who's here today, she's going to New York City soon. She knew that was coming. I didn't tell her until just now. But she's, her big plan in life is when she gets to New York City, she's going to this particular part in New York City where they sell cheap imitation counterfeit copycat stuff. And she's going to buy a boatload of it. <laughs> I remember when I was in Houston, Texas, a missionary and his wife came to town. They came to a Sunday morning. There was a Sunday night service at that point or maybe a Monday night revival. I don't know what, but I, I had the privilege. It was a super cool privilege that day. I got to quite an education. The missionary's wife wanted to go to Houston to the fake street, the copycat street, where she could buy a purse that looked like a purse that cost $1,000. But when we got there that day, she was only going to pay 35 bucks for it. And I was like, wow, they do this in life? This is like, what? She said, oh, yeah, man, watch this. She bought this purse. Sure enough, it looked just and like da, 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 this and that and the other. It should have been a $1,000 purse. She picked it up for pennies on the dollar. And she looked at me and she said, when we go back to church tonight, nobody will ever know. 
I can't make this stuff up. Did y'all read the spar sign today? They're selling true dog food. They didn't know I'm preaching this message today. I mean, how many times you've seen at a farm stand somebody offering, we're offering counterfeit dog food. Come and get it. That doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen. Krista, years ago, my wife Krista, years ago, she went to a gas station, got some gasoline, maybe a candy bar. They gave her some change back. It came with a $10 bill. She got home and she showed me that $10 bill. She said, I think this is fake. It's a counterfeit. I said, wow. She took it back to the gas station. She gave it to the gas station clerk and said, yes, here's the fake. I would like a real $10 bill. You know what the gas station clerk did that day, right? Nothing. Took the fake $10 bill and never paid her in a real $10 bill. She was just out. In this life, the enemy wants you to take a quick glance at something and believe that it's real because he is in the business of counterfeit, cheap shotting you. He's selling you a counterfeit love today, a counterfeit joy today. Oh, but Jesus is the real deal. This just happened this week. I didn't plan this. God did. Krista and I are driving into Ocala. We see a motorcycle. Krista and I's thing is that when we see a motorcycle, whoever can guess the, the make first it wins. We're both significantly competitive. And I'm looking and she's looking and I'm saying this and then she's saying that. and she's, she's pretty sure it's a Harley Davidson. And I said, no. I said, no, because look at that. I'm, no, look at that. No, no. And she says, yeah, but look at that. And I said, no, no. I put my foot down. <laughs> so I did put my foot down. And we sped up right beside this motorcycle riding down the road. I rolled down the window waving my arm. No, I didn't do all that. We're looking at the bike. We're inspecting the bike. I said, look at that, look at that. I, I said, Krista, you know. Krista grew up in a mechanic's home. Her father's a, a body man, a mechanic man. I mean, he knew cars, and she knows cars. She can tell you the make, model, and year of most cars that are out on the road. It's pretty impressive. And she's telling me about this bike, and I'm saying, it's, it's not. And then she finally agreed. And then she changed her tune and said, whoa, 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 whoa. Look, look, on the gas tank, that dude put in paint with a, with a paint stick, and he wrote Harley Davidson on the gas tank. And I threw my hands in the air, and I said, Krista, there's no way that is a Harley. And we both agreed, and then we laughed out loud. Who does that? Wow. How many of you ever heard of the Getty? The Getty Museum? 1974, Paul Getty started this private museum. By the time 1981 or 1982 rolled around, he had acquired $1.2 billion worth of art. He became the richest museum art museum owner in the world in 1997 rolled around he built this entire complex acres and acres and acres worth of buildings and courtyards and paintings and statues and all this stuff to the tune of this property cost two billion dollars to build more than that now listen i want you to grasp this watch this here we go two million say two million two million human beings visit the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, California every single year. That's nice, isn't it? Oh, but did you know in 1987, the Getty purchased a 530 B.C. Kuros, K-O-U-R-O-S. It's a statue of an ancient Greek man, typically naked. This one is naked. We have a picture for you. I didn't show you the whole picture. It's 530 B.C. This is, this is the picture of the, the head of the statue. When the Getty put this in their museum, they put word out on the web to the entire world, hey, we just purchased this Kuros, and it is an authentic 530 B.C. statue of a Greek man. 
and see it. Well, scholars and historians came and see it. And when they came, they began to have serious questions and serious doubts about this statue. If that was real or if that was a counterfeit. And so they started doing tests on the, on the make, the, the marble, the, the material, the, the way it swirls and about. And guess what? Scholars and historians and, and people in the profession, they all agreed this is a modern counterfeit forgery. The Getty spent $7 million on this piece and told the whole world to come see it. You know what the Getty did? They did not remove the statue and tell the world, hey, we just made a $7 million mistake. You know what they did? They kept the statue right there, but they took the old plaque out that said 530 BC, comma, Kuros. They put a new plaque in its place that says, and you can go to the Los Angeles, California this afternoon to the Getty Museum and see the statue, and it says 530 BC, comma, Kuros, dot, 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 or modern forgery. <laughs> Are you serious? And two million people a year go to see this counterfeit copycat? I was telling Tracy Baldale, I cannot believe. I this I can't believe it. This would be this, I can't believe it. I gotta go see this. And when I said I gotta go see this, those words just ran away from my face, and I thought. I can't believe I just said that. I've got what? Living in America. I feel good. Let me go see and chase some more counterfeit junk. Let me buy a plane ticket and go to the, one of the most busiest cities in the entire world and get a headache from all the fumes and go to the Getty Museum that you can't even walk in. You got to get a ticket and a pre blah, blah, blah and sign up online. I don't like signing up online for anything. To see a cheap counterfeit copycat. Oh, but here in America, we do it every single day of our lives. Oh, I mean, that's what we do. We chase cheap, counterfeit copycats. We're not interested in the real presence of God. I don't know why. Because His presence is powerful. It's healing. It's warm. It's fantastic. It's everything that you and I need because Jesus is the real deal. It'd be one thing if the Getty said, oh, you know what? <laughs> hey, everybody, come see the spectacle of this cheap counterfeit that we paid $7 million for. See, now it's not a counterfeit. That's a real cheap imitation. Okay? Okay. My wife used to sell costume jewelry. That's what she called it. And I would see when ladies would give her $100. Dollar bills. I said, Krista, are you telling these people this is costume jewelry? She said, yeah, it's real. And then there was this 14-letter scientific word of the plastic that it was made out of. It's re it was real counterfeit. It was, it was real cheap junk. You see, when the enemy tries to sell you something, he's selling it to you. As if it's the real deal. We have a definition of the word real. It's the actual thing. Miss Julia's looking. Thank you very much. It's actually existing. Real is something that actually exists. Or occurring in fact. It is a fact that Jesus was born on this planet. It is a fact that he is the son of God. It is a fact that he lived and he died. And it is a fact that his disciples did not believe that he was the Messiah until after he rose from the dead and they saw him eating in their house. That's a fact. And when they saw him eating in the house, that is a fact. Then they all but one died for him and his name's sake. And the one that didn't, was boiled in oil. His name's John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. We have the definition of counterfeit. 
made an exact imitation of something valuable with the intention to deceive or defraud. Friend, please, today, starting right now, immediately, we got four weeks of this. I'm super excited about this. Jesus is real. And if he's real, the Bible's real. If the Bible's real, God is real. If God is real, the salvation offered in his Bible is real. The healing offered in his Bible is real. The peace, say peace, the peace of mind that's offered in the word of God is real deal. It's not a cheap counterfeit copycat. We all have junk. Some of you wore junk to church today. Some of us drove junk to church today. We all have junk. This entire world is full of junk. How many of you ever heard of Salvador Dali? Yeah? We got a picture of him. You might recognize the style of painting. He's the guy that does this kind of stuff. Whatever you call it. I don't know. Sir, I that about something. He is the most number one counterfeited painter in the world. Over 50,000 of his paintings have been sold as the real deal and people losing their life savings over it. As a matter of fact, March 29th, 2024, I had no idea this was going on in the world. But last week, two men got put in prison because they scammed 125 people out of three and a half million dollars worth of their hard-earned money. Some of them spending their entire life savings on cheap, counterfeit copycats. How many of you know the Bible says that if you gain the whole world but lose your soul, what does a profit a person I mean, if this man, Dolly, his most expensive painting ever sold at an auction was $13.5 million. And let's say you have that at home. Friend, on judgment day, when Jesus comes back, when you go from this life to the next, at some point, that $13.5 million painting from one of the most famous painters in all of history is going to be classified and put in the category of junk. I've got a lot of junk. You've got a lot of junk. Having junk is not terrible. We just have to recognize it for what it is. It is cheap imitation copycat for hope, love, joy, and peace. Oh, but I want to search and seek the real deal. His name is Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the King of Glory. Got a scripture, Miss Julia. Take us straight to Matthew chapter 7. Probably the very last scripture. Thank you, ma'am. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads to the way of destruction and eternal loss. And there are many who enter it, but small is the gate and narrow and difficult to travel is the path that leads to the way of everlasting life. The Bible says, and only few will find it. Because what we do as human beings is chase counterfeit copycats and not the real deal. Julia, show us a picture of Jack Stoof. I don't know if any of you ever heard of the multimillionaire, Mr. Forrest Finn. But in 2010, he took a treasure box and he buried it in the Rocky Mountains to the tune of about $2 million worth of contents on the inside. There was 265 gold coins and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gold nuggets. He wrote a 24-line poem and he put it out on the internet and he told the whole entire world, come and find the treasure box. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people went to the Rocky Mountains on their vacations and on their trips and they took off work. One lady spent 75 thousand dollars of her cold hard-earned cash on trying to find this treasure 
Other families relocated, changed their occupation, and moved to the Rocky Mountains in an area where they thought they were close to finding this treasure. In 2020, in month, in March of 2020, a man by the name of Mark Sexton was the fifth and final person who lost his life looking for the treasure. They found his frozen body at the top of Dinosaur National Park, right on the border of Colorado and Utah. And in June of 2020, after much spent, after much chasing, after much thinking, after much planning, After a lot of work and a lot of hours and a lot of money spent, Jack Stoof found the treasure in Yellowstone National Park. The Bible says, Miss Julia, take me to those two scriptures, Matthew chapter 13, 44, and we'll read 45 and 46. I want you to watch this. The kingdom of heaven is like a very precious, say precious, Worship team, you can come now. It's like a precious treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field, securing the treasure for himself. We'll read the next, the very next illustration that Jesus talks about what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who went looking from town to town and place to place looking for fine pearls. And when he found the one that he was looking for, he went home and he sold everything he had so that he could have that pearl. What Jesus is saying here, the kingdom of heaven is like, once you get a glimpse, once you get a touch, once you get a feel, once you understand that Jesus is the real deal, you go home and get rid of everything, every idea and everything else in the whole entire world, and you come racing back to Jesus because you want more. When that dude found that thing in that, in that field, he knew there would be more. And so he sold everything and he went back to, the, he bought that field. And he went digging for more. If you're an industry, if you're a businessman or businesswoman, the name of the game is to make money. That's okay. That's good. It's positive. Make money. That's what Jesus is saying. This man was in the business of making money, finding treasure. He did it. Jesus illustrates in the spiritual manner. When we go looking for Jesus in the spiritual realm and we find him, we get a glimpse, we get a touch, we get a feel, we get a, a certain presence, we get a healing Jesus says, oh, when you experience the real deal, you scrap everything else in the whole world and you try to go get more. Today in your life, I want you to try to get more. I want you to seek Jesus with all of your heart, your mind, your body and soul. Would you please stand with me? Prayer team, would you please come? Today's the day of victory. I'm super excited about this series. We got three weeks to go. Jesus is real. The enemy puts so many smoke screens in front of you, so many counterfeit copycat stuff in our lives, in our head. Everybody just take your hand and put it on your head. And I just want you to say, Jesus, help me. Just say that this morning. Jesus, help me in my mind. I want to see the real deal Jesus work in my life, I want to seek him and chase him. I was sitting at a table long, not that long ago. And I love it when people sit around and they want to talk theology or the Bible and they're blowing smoke and blah, 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 blah. And then this person said, well, I think, and then I smacked him right in the face. No, I did not. I did not. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I think. I'm picking on myself. That's a cue for you to pick on yourself. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is, is what does the Bible say? What does the Bible promise? What, what, what is the Bible all about? Who is this 
King of glory. Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? What is it that he wants with me? These are legitimate questions. It's cool. If you have questions for Jesus, keep asking and keep seeking and keep looking because the Bible says, Jesus says, oh, those who knock, I'm going to answer the door. Those who seek, oh, you're going to find. That's what I want for you this morning. That's what Jesus wants for you this morning. If today you'd like Jesus to be your Savior, if you'd like for Him to be your one and only, if you'd like for Him to heal your body, if you'd like Him to help you make decisions in this life, if you'd like Him to walk with you, talk with you, hold you, comfort you, if that's you today, if you want Him to be the Savior of your soul, the Savior of your life, repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I love you. I need you. Heal my body. Heal my mind. Save my soul. Forgive my sins. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for your bloodshed. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Friend, allow Jesus to finish what he started in your life this morning. Here at River Life, we just like to sing a song and allow God, allow him to send his presence, allow him to hold our hands, give us comfort, healing, salvation. Take advantage of this moment. If you want prayer for anything at all, you can come see one of our friends. We are not going to get into your business. We're just going to pray with you, encourage you. Take advantage of this moment. I'm super glad you came. Thank you very, very much for coming this morning. Let's allow Jesus to finish what he started in our life today.